Section 20 of The Outline of Science, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Coos, John Thomas Coos Kuzmarski. The Outline of Science by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 20, Applied Science, Part 3, Flying, Part 1. One of the greatest scientific triumphs of the present age was the solution of the problem of flight. Since the legendary days, when Icarus flew too near the sun and was killed, flying has stirred the imagination of man, and every age has added a little to the history of flight. To the twentieth century belongs the day that man first flew in a heavier-than-air motor-propelled machine. The Great War, which broke out in August 1914, gave aviation the impetus it needed to develop it from the pursuit of a few enthusiasts to the powerful thing it now is. There were thousands of young men in the autumn of 1914 who had never previously given a thought to flying, who, in the course of a few months, became the Balls, Bishops, and McCuddens, who thrilled the world with their amazing deeds. The war ended, flying had become an accepted everyday fact. Soon we saw Alcock, Ross Smith, and Van Reineveld accomplish flights across the Atlantic to Australia and to South Africa. The first airplane to fly successfully was built by the Wright brothers. Orville Wright, flying for 12 seconds on December 17, 1903. Three further flights were made in the same day, the longest lasting 59 seconds and covering a distance of 852 feet. This machine was fitted with an engine of only 16 horsepower and flew at about 35 miles an hour. Later, the Wrights carried out flights of many miles and were unable to attain recognition until 1908, when Wilbur Wright gave many exhibition flights in Europe. Today, we have aircraft fitted with engines totaling over 1,500 horsepower and flying at speeds of over 200 miles an hour. Three Great Flights Within less than 20 years from the first flight of the Brothers Wright, flights across the Atlantic to South Africa and to Australia were made. The first of these was that of Alcock and Brown from Newfoundland across the Atlantic to Ireland, the journey being made in just over 16 hours against the normal period of six days for boat traveling. This, however, must be looked upon in the nature of a show performance. It is unlikely that we shall see just yet a regular airplane service across the Atlantic. This service is more likely to be carried out by airships, and it will be recollected that the R-34 made the trip from New York to Norfolk in just over three days, which was less than half the time required by the average liner. When speaking of commercial air routes, it must be remembered that if an airplane has to make a very long non-stop flight, it has to carry an enormous quantity of petrol. The lift of an airplane is limited, and if most of the weight is taken up by petrol, very few passengers and very little cargo can be carried and flying ceases to become a commercial proposition. If flights are made in shorter stages, sufficient petrol can be carried with a greater load of passengers and goods. Probably 250 miles is about the economic limit of airplane aerial transport stages. The next epoch making flight was that of Ross Smith and Keith Smith from England to Australia. This flight has a very direct bearing on commercial aviation as it was not so much in the nature of a stunt as the Atlantic flight, but was carried out in stages with remarkable regularity. A schedule was laid down, and owing to the excellence of the machine, was carried out almost to the hour, the whole trip being made in thirty days. The chief difficulty encountered on this trip was the lack of organization of the route. From London as far as India, all went comparatively well, for an efficient organization extends from England through France, Italy, and Greece to Egypt, and thence through Palestine and Mesopotamia and the Persian Gulf to India. After India, little has been done, and though excellent work was carried out by local authorities to help to make 
the flight a success, it was the third part of the journey which was the most difficult. The next flight was that from England to South Africa, carried out by Van Rijnveld and Brand. From England to Egypt, the journey was comparatively simple. After Egypt, the difficult part of the route was encountered. The writer had a great deal to do with the organization of the routes from England to Egypt, and Egypt to India, and later with the Cairo-Cape Town route. It was the middle section of this line which gave most trouble. Vegetation was so thick that it was only by employing huge gangs of negroes that the trees and undergrowth could be cleared away, in order to make landing places. So luxuriant was the growth that by the time the laborers had cleared the ground and reached the far end of the aerodrome, the vegetation was already several feet high on the part on which they had commenced. It was only by continual work that the growth was kept under. A further difficulty was the presence of white ants, which built mounds from three to ten feet high with great rapidity. In many cases these mounds were so hard that they had to be removed by means of dynamite and gunpowder. Tools and machinery were non-existent, and rough places had to be rolled smooth with trunks of trees hewn down and pushed backwards and forwards by gangs of natives. Between the aerodromes, the tropical forest made safe landing impossible in case of engine failure. Further difficulties were experienced owing to the heat of the central African plateau. In order to economize labor, the aerodromes had been made on the small side. The heat and rarefied air made it difficult for machines to rise without a very long run, and in several cases the aerodromes had to be extended before the airplanes could be got off. Of the four machines trying to make this flight, three crashed at various stages. Van Rijnveld and Brand succeeded, however, in getting through, though they reached Cape Town in a different machine to that in which the flight was commenced. Weather on the airways. Apart from these great flights, modern aircraft are capable of astounding performances. They can carry loads of upwards of 24 tons, fly at 200 miles an hour, cover distances of over 1,000 miles without stopping, rise to heights as great as Mount Everest. Daily, they fly from end to end of Europe and from the Atlantic to the Pacific across the USA. The state of the weather is a certain handicap to airmen, but immense strides are being made both in the organization of local reports and also in overcoming difficulties. The only real weather danger when flying is fog. On several occasions, when the wind has been so rough that the cross-channel streamers have been storm-bound in harbor, aircraft have safely made the journey between London and Paris, when the country is fog-bound, flying becomes a different matter. It is not the actual flying which is interfered with, for pilots can control machines perfectly well whilst in the air, even in foggy weather, but it is the danger of not being able to see the ground beneath, and therefore not being able to choose a safe spot in the event of a forced landing, that makes flying in fog dangerous. Even when the journey is accomplished, as is normally the case, without a forced landing, the pilot finds it impossible to pick out the aerodrome and may quite well hit a building or a hedge or overshoot the mark when endeavoring to land. The system of weather reporting employed on the airways between London and Paris is simple in the extreme. Reports are sent in from the intermediate stations by wireless at frequent intervals and are posted up at all the aerodromes en route. Before starting on any particular flight, the pilot can always obtain the exact report of the weather conditions then prevailing at all points on his route. As in other things, it is the man who counts as much as the machine. The difficulties encountered sometimes demand courage, skill, and resource on the part of the pilot. We may give one instance. On an occasion during the winter of 1921, when the weather was extremely foggy on the London-Paris route, Meteorological information came through to the aerodrome at Paris that the route was covered in mist, but there was a chance of it clearing later. Three machines, two British and one French, decided to attempt the journey, and with full loads of passengers, left Le Bourget Aerodrome. 
The French machine landed at Poy when less than a third of the journey had been done. The pilot, being unable to stand the strain of flying, with only occasional glimpses of the ground, and not knowing where he would land if his engine cut out. The two British machines continued their journey until the channel was reached, when the fog descended lower and lower until both were crossing the water at a height where the machines almost grazed the masts of the occasional ships over which they passed. Mackintosh, the pilot of the Handley Page, decided it was so foggy, a few feet from the earth, he would be no worse off higher up. He pushed up the nose of his machine and climbed some thousands of feet into the fog-filled air. The other machine crept on, feeling its way across the channel, until it crossed the coast near Folkestone. By that time the suspense had almost worn out the pilot, and having accomplished the most important part of his journey, and got his passengers across the channel, he landed at Limpna, a landing in fog. By means of steering on a compass course, and by the guidance he received through his wireless, Mackintosh flew on with his load of passengers until he was over Croydon Aerodrome. He knew he was over the aerodrome by the wireless signals he was receiving from below, so he throttled back his engine, pulled down the nose of his machine, and hoped that as he dropped to earth the fog would become clearer and he would be able to sight the aerodrome and land gradually. The altimeter dropped to 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, and 500 feet, but still he was wrapped in a dense mist. On his wireless he was conversing continually with the people on the ground who were endeavoring to guide him to earth. On the ground the sound of the motors could be plainly heard as the Handley page circled round and round, vainly endeavoring to get a glimpse of the earth so that it could come down. Rockets were fired into the air to give some guidance, but without success. All they could do was to wait and hope for the best. The men waiting by the motor ambulance started up the engine and got ready their first aid appliances. As the fog extended right down to the surface of the ground, it did not appear possible that Mackintosh would be able to bring down the machine in safety, and with nine people on board there seemed every likelihood of a dangerous crash. For some twenty minutes the drone of the engines continued, getting fainter as the machine moved away and growing stronger as it came back to the aerodrome under the guidance of the wireless. At last the roar suddenly died down to a whisper, and as the waiting officials looked at each other, expecting every minute to hear the sound of the crash, the huge machine suddenly loomed out of the fog and landed literally at their feet outside the custom house. When the door of the airplane was unlocked, the passengers came out one by one, quite unperturbed, not realizing that they had been in any danger, and wondering what all the fuss was about. Wireless and Civil Aviation Wireless Telegraphy and Telephony of course, are important factors in modern flying. The civilian pilot resorts to them before commencing a flight to find out weather conditions along the route. He reports progress by wireless from the air as he flies at 100 miles per hour. He announces the time of his probable arrival if he wants the ground illuminated for a night landing. He is guided on his way by wireless if he flies in fog. He converses with the pilots of other aircraft by means of his wireless telephone. In the future, it is quite possible that aircraft will be entirely controlled by wireless from the ground, whilst motive power may well be transmitted from ground stations to the machine in flight. The future of flying and wireless are bound together. The first requisite of a good commercial airplane is the ability to carry a heavy load at a low cost. In other words, the weight carried must be kept up whilst the engine power is kept down. The next essential is speed. Then comes slow landing, so that the machine may be brought down safely in any spot in the event of a forced landing. Rapidity of climbing power, the quality of being easy to maneuver, and ability to fly to great altitudes need not be considered when commercial aircraft are being designed. One of the best commercial airplanes at the present time, 1922, is the DH-34. This machine, with a Napier engine of 450 horsepower, 
carries ten passengers in an enclosed cabin in addition to the pilot and steward another machine is the d eight twenty nine this is a monoplane fitted with a four hundred and fifty horsepower napier engine having accommodation for twelve passengers in an enclosed cabin the d eight series of machines illustrates excellently the improvements in design of commercial machines the engine power remains about the same but the revenue load increases this is made possible by improvements in the design of the machine itself abroad the farman goliath is a good illustration of present-day commercial aircraft this machine carries twelve passengers in addition to a pilot and a mechanic and is fitted with two two hundred and sixty horsepower salmson engines many people are of opinion that multiplication of engines tends to increase safety this is a debatable point for very few twin engine machines are able to fly with only one engine running makers frequently claim that the machine will fly with one engine only but in actual practice with a full load nine twin engine machines out of ten become unmanageable unless both engines are running or both are cut off though aircraft are undoubtedly growing more and more essential as military weapons of defense and offense there is no doubt that their greatest future lies in civilian spheres at the present time we are gradually feeling our way until the time when better machines better knowledge of the air better organizations and more public support enable us to cover the earth with a network of airways there is reasonable hope that in the not distant future all mails will be airborne and much of the long distance passenger traffic will be by air the carriage of heavy goods and short distance passenger traffic is another matter it is probable that for many years to come the bulk of this traffic will be carried by older methods of transport finding the way in the air the first thing to be done before civil flying becomes an everyday matter is the marking out of the aerial routes which will be used these should be provided with small emergency landing grounds at intervals of ten to twenty miles so that aircraft can always have a clear spot in which to land no matter what the emergency these aerodromes must be fitted up with ground lights so that pilots in charge of night flying machines will have the same advantages as pilots flying by day there is little need to signpost the air by means of kite balloons or searchlight signals as has sometimes been suggested for with the development of wireless for direction finding and of efficient maps any pilot can find his way with ease there are several methods of finding the way in the air the first of these is for the pilot to compare the ground over which he flies with his map this is the simplest and most accurate but can only be used when the atmosphere is clear and the ground beneath visible the second method is to work out the correct compass bearing before starting a flight and then proceed solely by means of compass guidance until the destination is reached unfortunately the currents of air tend to make an airplane drift out of its course so that the pilot flying on a compass course has occasionally to check his position by comparing his map and the ground the third and most up-to-date method is by wireless direction finding by means of which signals are sent out when requested by the pilot from one or more ground stations and the direction of the currents marked by the pilot on the map the point where these lines intersect is his position at the time one serious problem which confronts the man who is likely to use a private airplane is the question of aerodrome accommodation an aerodrome large enough to accommodate all types of aircraft must have a minimum area of about sixty acres needless to say each man cannot have his own aerodrome but it is suggested that each village will have its own landing ground and that the users of private airplanes will proceed to the aerodrome when they wish to fly how an airplane flies the method by which an airplane flies is very similar to that which maintains a kite in the air a kite is pulled against the wind by a string to get pressure the wind tending to blow the kite away and the string to hold it back the result is that as long as the wind and the pull remain constant the kite tends to rise in an airplane the string 
which pulls the kite is replaced by an air screw with a kite if the center of the pressure is altered it dips and swerves in an airplane a similar thing happens causing the airplane to be bumped birds have this trouble also rooks landing on a windy day are often tilted off their balance and have either to try again or land badly in the air they may be noticed adjusting themselves to the bumps caused by sudden alterations in the center of air pressure so far as flying is concerned the wings are the most important part of an airplane there may be one two or more sets of planes according to the type of machine monoplane biplane triplane etc these planes are slightly curved the apex of the curve being nearer the front than the near of the wing the thickness of a plane also varies for it gains in breadth somewhat abruptly from the front to the apex of the curve and then narrows down gradually to the rear of the plane when in flight this wing is not absolutely parallel to the path of flight but is slightly tilted so that the wind blows against its under surface the rush of air round the wing sets up pressure on the underside and suction on the top surface the so-called lift of a wing being about two-thirds suction and one-third pressure in order to keep up the flow of air round the wings an airplane has to be fitted with a motor an internal combustion engine built on similar principles to the engine of a motor car this engine revolves the air screw which either pulls or pushes the wings through the air and so causes the necessary lift to be set up what the pilot does the control of an airplane is simple in the extreme there are two levers for the use of the pilot one an upright control lever known as the joystick which works the elevator and ailerons or wing flaps the other a rudder bar set near the floor of the machine and operated by the pilot's feet in addition there are the ordinary switches and ignition and throttle controls for the engine which at present is always of the internal combustion type the principle of the internal combustion aero engine is as follows though types vary in themselves all work on the four stroke or auto cycle principle the action of the engine is divided into four operations each operation occupying one stroke of the piston the first stroke sucks a mixture of petrol gas and air into the cylinder the second compresses the gas as the piston moves up the cylinder just before the compression is at its greatest an electric spark produced by a magneto or batteries and conducted to the cylinder through a sparking plug explodes the compressed gas and the expansion of the burnt gas forces the piston down the cylinder again the energy being transmitted to a flywheel and keeps revolutions regular the fourth action of the piston expels the burnt gas from the cylinder at the fifth stroke the cycle of operations recommences these strokes are called in the order given above the induction or sucking in stroke the compression stroke the ignition or power stroke and the exhaust stroke air engines are of three main types stationary radial and rotating cylinder generally called rotary in rising a pilot opens out his engine until the airplane is moving across the ground at a sufficient speed he then gently draws the control lever in towards him and in so doing moves the elevator which causes the airplane to rise into the air when sufficient height has been attained a slight movement forward of the control lever causes the airplane to flatten out and fly on an even keel when turning the pilot simultaneously presses his foot on the rudder bar thus moving over the rudder and at the same time moves the control lever in the same direction this movement of the control lever operates the ailerons or wing flaps so that the airplane tilts up slightly on one wing tip and is therefore able to turn more easily and more safely than if it made a flat turn with the rudder alone when the turn has been made the operations are reversed and the airplane again brought on an even keel to descend the pilot throttles back the engine simultaneously pushing forward the control lever 
this moving the elevator so that the machine dips downwards and glides towards earth. When a few feet from the ground, he gently moves back the control lever so that the airplane assumes a horizontal position, and as it loses speed with the engine throttled right back and the propeller turning very slowly, it sinks gently to earth and runs along the ground to a standstill. A glide can be made in any direction, but the landing itself should be made upwind. The landing speed of airplanes varies according to the type, some coming to earth at about 30 miles per hour and others at nearly 100 miles per hour. Probably an average is 50 to 55 miles per hour. Aerial maneuvers are all simple to the experienced pilot, and if properly performed, involve no strain on the machine which the designer has not taken into consideration. Smoothness of movement and absence of jerking of the controls are essential. An airplane in a nose dive should be corrected slowly. If the pilot abruptly pulls back the control lever, the machine may be injured in a vital part owing to the sudden extra strain. Aerial stunts, or aerobatics, as they are officially called, need slightly different methods in different types of craft. Generally speaking, the principal maneuvers performed are spinning, looping, and side-slipping. In spinning, the pilot throttles the engine right back, pulls the control lever right back, and pushes the rudder hard over. Ruddering to the left will cause a left spin and vice versa. To come out of a spin, the pilot centralizes all the controls, and when a dive results, he gently pulls back the control over until the machine once more attains an even keel. In looping, the pilot pushes the control lever slightly forward so that the nose of the machine drops and additional speed is gained. Then he pulls the control lever back when the machine will put up her nose and loop. As the machine descends from the loop, the pilot gradually centralizes the control lever. On certain types, it is necessary to use the rudder control to prevent the machine swinging and slipping off the top of a loop. In side slipping, the pilot, to side slip to the left, pushes the control lever over to left and keeps the rudder central. When the machine commences to slip, he puts on a little right or top rudder to prevent the machine turning to left. To level up, the pilot pushes the control lever to the right and slightly forward, keeping the rudder central. Almost every stunt is a variation or combination of these three maneuvers. To those unused to flying, a spin is an unpleasant sensation, which, if unintentionally caused, is usually due to stalling or losing flying speed. It is, however, not at all dangerous and can easily be counteracted by the pilot. Bumping is the slight rocking motion felt when an upward or downward current of air is encountered. It is usually felt most when flying low in hot weather, but small bumps are invariably encountered under all conditions. In extreme cases, in a thunderstorm or when flying over the desert, the machine may descend or ascend a hundred feet or more in one bump. Needless to say, even such extreme cases as this are not in the least dangerous, though possibly unpleasant. End of section 20. Recording by John Thomas Coos, John Thomas Coos Kuzmarski, www.validateyourlife.com. Section 21 of The Outline of Science, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Coos, John Thomas Coos Kuzmarski. The Outline of Science by J. Arthur Thompson. Applied Science, Part 3, Flying, Part 2. War in the Air. The needs and requirements of military machines and commercial airplanes differ greatly. The military machine, intended for fighting, must be very fast, capable of climbing to great heights at tremendous speeds, and capable of being quickly maneuvered in every possible way. On more than one occasion, the flying qualities of his machine enabled a pilot to save his life during the Great War. Captain H. W. Woolett of Number 43 Squadron 
achieved the war's record by bringing down six enemy aircraft in one day very largely owing to the excellent qualities of his machine thus at ten thirty a m whilst leading a patrol he saw a german machine outmaneuvered it fired about thirty rounds and saw it spin down and crash during this fight he had been attacked by several other machines without delay he climbed rapidly above his attackers and dived on to a two-seater firing as he went causing this machine also to crash once again he outclimbed his opponents looped away from two attacking fokkers made a vertical bank and again dived on the tail of an albatross after he had fired about forty rounds this machine burst into flames and fell to pieces he then went home at five p m the same evening he attacked thirteen enemy aircraft having absolute confidence in his own skill as a pilot and knowing that his machine could outmaneuver any of those he was attacking he first fired thirty rounds into one of the enemy airplanes which turned over on its back and fell to pieces he then climbed again maneuvered rapidly among the remaining twelve machines avoiding the fire of his opponents until he could fire a burst into an albatross which spun down and crashed he then made for home on crossing the lines he saw another enemy machine above him once more the climb of his bus enabled him to get over his enemy and he crashed his sixth machine for the day this day's work the record for the war illustrates the necessity for speed in the air speed in climb and maneuverability another incident showing the value of maneuverability occurred when lieutenant mcleod of the r a f won his v c he was attacked at a height of about five thousand feet by eight german triplanes which dived at him from all directions flying hard mcleod was flying a two-seater and by skillful flying he enabled his observer to fire at each enemy machine in turn bringing down three of them out of control mcleod then looped his bus despite the fact that he had by then been wounded five times and dived at a fourth airplane unfortunately two of the other five survivors got above him and firing from above hit the petrol tank and set his machine on fire mcleod scorched by the flames climbed out of his seat to the left bottom plane and stood there leaning over to the cockpit to reach the control lever and causing the plane to side slip steeply thus blowing the flames away from him and his observer meanwhile the observer was able to stick to his seat and fire at the enemy keeping them at bay until the ground was reached instances such as these illustrate the value of maneuver more than anything else the man and the machine the psychology of the war pilot is an interesting study and was closely investigated during the war it was found that the most successful pilots of single-seater scout fighters are of the impulsive careless type willing to run any risk without thought of the danger men like this attack a dozen enemy machines single-handed at sight and rage in the air like mad dogs biting at everything they more than any other type cause the british pilots to be feared on all fronts the pilot of a two-seater fighter needs to be a little more cautious he has to think of his observer even if he forgets himself when the two work well together they form a wonderful combination reconnaissance and artillery pilots are regarded as the brainy members of the force their job is to watch signal and draw deductions usually they are protected by scouts and if called upon must be able to look after themselves in aerial combat the remaining type the bomber pilots need great powers of endurance and coolness under shell fire they have to pilot heavy machines for many hours on end 
and endure heavy shell and machine-gun fire without flinching, whilst the observer drops his bombs. As a representative of a two-seater fighting machine, the Bristol Fighter undoubtedly stands first among the world's aircraft. This machine carries a pilot and observer, and is fitted with a 275-horsepower Rolls-Royce or a 300-horsepower Hispano-Suiza engine. It has a full speed of 124 miles per hour, and can climb to 10,000 feet in 21.3 minutes, whilst the ultimate height to which it can attain is about 20,000 feet. Its armament consists of a machine gun firing forward through the propeller and operated by the pilot, and a second machine gun operated by the observer, which can be moved about to command the whole of the rear of the machine. The device which enables the pilot to fire his machine gun absolutely between the revolving blades of the air screw is exceedingly ingenious. It is known as the Constantinesco interrupter gear. By means of a communication between the engine of the machine and the gun itself, the gun is timed not to fire on those occasions when the blades of the propeller would be in the path of the bullet. As the propeller revolves at the rate of about 750 revolutions per minute, the ingenuity of this arrangement can well be imagined. For a representative single-seater, the sop with snipe may be taken as an example. This machine was produced shortly before the end of the war and is fitted with a 200-horsepower Bentley Rotary 2 engine which gives the machine a full speed of 135 miles per hour. It can climb to 10,000 feet in 8.8 .8 minutes, and the armament consists of three machine guns, all firing forward between the blades of the air screw. To protect himself from attack in the rear, the pilot depends entirely upon the flying qualities of his machine. For a typical bomber, one may take the Vickers Vimy, this carries a pilot, gunner, and bomber together with a load of 1,146 pounds of bombs. It also carries four Lewis guns for defense in case of attack, two being placed in the nose of the machine and two in the fuselage, the body of the machine. Though fitted with two 360-horsepower Rolls-Royce engines, it does not travel very fast only being capable of about 107 miles per hour, whilst it takes 23 minutes to climb to 10,000 feet. It may be of interest to know that the biggest crew for any British airplane during the war was carried by the Handley Page V-1500 type, which was built for bombing Berlin. This machine, 126 feet in span and fitted with four Rolls-Royce engines, carried a pilot and observer, two bombers, and two gunners, six in all, and in addition carried 24 230-pound bombs. The total weight of bombs dropped by British machines on the Western Front alone from July 1916 to November 11, 1918, was 6,402 tons, the heaviest bomb weighing about 1,500 pounds. The biggest German bomb weighed 2,200 pounds. During the same period on the Western Front, the RAF brought down 6,904 enemy aircraft and 258 kite balloons. In addition, 401,375 photographs were taken and 10,238,182 rounds of machine gun ammunition were fired at German troops on the ground. Turning to airships, we find that Britain now has the largest fleet and biggest vessels in the world. One of these, the L-71, an ex-German Zeppelin, is the biggest in existence. In addition to L-71, we also possess the ex-Zeppelin L-64, whilst the purely British vessels include R-33, R-36, R-80, and the incomplete R-37, a sister ship of the ill-fated R-38. Of all these vessels, only R-36 is at present fitted up for passenger work. She has accommodations for the carriage of 50 passengers in addition to a crew of 27. Sleeping bunks, which can be folded away during the day, 
are provided for all travellers whilst the dining-room and saloon are fitted up with tables and chairs and are comfortable in every way a ship of this type could make the journey from england to australia stopping at malta egypt aden india and singapore on the way in less than a fortnight when the service is an accomplished fact mooring masts will probably be erected at all intermediate stations and sheds only at the termini it must be remembered that a shed to house an airship between two and three hundred yards long costs over one hundred thousand pounds in addition a crew of some hundreds of men is necessary to take one of these aerial monsters to its berth or bring it out to the open a mooring mast costs less than twenty five thousand to erect the up-to-date form of mast consists of a lattice-work tower with a top which revolves easily from the revolving top a cable can be let out and when an airship approaches a second cable is let down from the nose of the vessel the two cables are then connected and a steam winch hauls in the slack gradually drawing the airship closer until her nose fits into a socket in the revolving head of the mast so fixed she will always swing with her nose upwind and can safely outride winds of forty to fifty miles per hour velocity the additional advantage which mooring has as against berthing in a shed is that it's then half a dozen men are needed to moor an airship and the act of release is even simpler passengers and goods are carried to the top of the mast in a lift so that no inconvenience is experienced by travellers the actual dimensions of the airships which we have in britain are as follows airship r thirty three length six hundred and thirty nine feet five inches cubic capacity one thousand nine hundred and fifty eight cubic feet engines five three hundred fifty horsepower sunbeams gross lift fifty nine point four tons range of action five thousand miles speed sixty three point five miles per hour airship r thirty six and thirty seven length six hundred and seventy two feet two inches cubic capacity two thousand one hundred one cubic feet engines two two hundred sixty horsepower may box and three three hundred and fifty horsepower sunbeams cossack gross lift sixty three point eight tons range of action four thousand miles speed sixty five miles per hour airship r eighty length five hundred and thirty feet cubic capacity one thousand two hundred and fifty cubic feet engines four two hundred and sixty horsepower may box gross lift thirty eight point five tons range of action six thousand five hundred miles speed sixty five miles per hour airship l seventy one length seven hundred forty three feet cubic capacity two thousand four hundred twenty cubic feet engines six two hundred sixty horsepower may box gross lift seventy eight tons range of action six thousand miles speed seventy five miles per hour the future of airships with regard to the future of airships it is safe to say that they will be utilized for mail passenger and goods services for the long distance routes whereas airplanes will be employed on routes up to about one thousand miles in length which routes will be covered in stages of about two hundred fifty miles each airships will make flights such as that from england to australia in stages of at least one thousand miles at a time similarly we shall probably organize an airship service to south africa and another across the atlantic to canada whilst possibly the canadian route may be continued across the pacific to australia thus giving us a british airship service encircling the globe perhaps the most famous airship flight in the world was the trip of r thirty four across the atlantic and back the outward journey of about three thousand miles was made in one hundred and eight hours twelve minutes a crew of eight officers and twenty-two men being carried 
Major Scott being in command. There was plenty of excitement on the outward journey, particularly when the ship got into a thunderstorm off Newfoundland. The return journey was made in better time, only 75 hours, 3 minutes, being taken over the trip. How an airship is built. The structure of airships necessarily varies considerably, as there are three main types, non-rigid, semi-rigid, and rigid. The first consisting of an envelope to which is attached a car, the second having the envelope strengthened with girders, and the third consisting of a girder framework inside which are several gas bags, the whole being attached to a rigid keel which carries the cabins and engine gondolas. The rigid type is the most important and is capable of the greatest development. To this class belong the Zeppelins and the British R types, which are copies of Zeppelins. The R-33 type has a streamline hull built up of duralumin girders, her overall length being 639 feet and her diameter 79 feet. The hull is fitted with an internal triangular keel, which forms the main corridor of the ship. It contains water, ballast, and petrol tanks, bomb stowage, quarters for the crew, etc. Inside the hull are 19 gas bags, which are charged with approximately 2 million cubic feet of hydrogen. At the forward end of the keel is slung a gondola, which forms the control cabin and carries the forward engine. Amidships, are slung two small wing gondolas, each carrying an engine, and near the rear is a larger car containing two engines and an auxiliary control system. The rudders and elevators are aft of this rear car at the tail end of the hull. The safety of flying. It is quite a mistaken notion that flying is unsafe and unreliable. During the 12 months, October 1920 to September 1921, 41,956 passengers were carried in civil aircraft in Great Britain. The mileage covered was approximately 553,700 miles, whilst the number of hours spent in the air by the machines was 6,776. For this period of flying, the number of passengers killed was four and the number of passengers injured was two. During the six months, April to September 1921, half the period under review, one passenger was killed and one injured out of 31,853 carried, and neither of these accidents happened on the regular airways, but simply during joy-riding exhibitions. The casualty rate, therefore, worked out at 0.03 passengers killed and 0.03 passengers injured per thousand carried, whilst 32,200 miles were covered for each accident and 415 hours flown for each accident. These figures do not make civil flying seem unduly dangerous, particularly if a comparison is made with accidents of other methods of transport. Street accidents for 1920 in Britain totaled 57,747, of which 2,837 were fatal. Rail accidents in 1919 totaled 24,915, of which 932 were fatal. These figures will probably surprise many railway users. With regard to reliability, the figures are quite convincing, especially when it is remembered that flying is at present in its infancy, and may naturally be expected to grow increasingly efficient as the time goes on. Up to the end of September 1921, the Figures for the British air transport services between London and Paris, which were completed without delay, were as follows. January, 62.5%. February, 76%. March, 95.4%. April, 94.8%. May, 94.7%. June, 91%. July, 93.8%. August, 94.8%. And September, 93%. These figures do not appear too bad, particularly when it is borne in mind that on several occasions when the weather was too rough for the cross-channel steamers to make the trip, aircraft flew safely between the two capitals. The future. 
aircraft fifty years hence will probably be very different machines from those employed at the present day possibly helicopters machines which can rise and land vertically hover and attach horizontal flight will have been sufficiently developed to make it possible to bring air traffic into the hearts of cities landing on roofs or in other confined areas the present idea of a helicopter is to have a body for the carriage of pilot and passengers attached to two or more air screws revolving horizontally in opposite directions so that the machine may arise and descend vertically this however is of little use in itself and it must be so perfected that in addition to vertical flight horizontal flight both forwards and sideways can be achieved many problems confront the designer but these will be overcome in course of time height indicators showing the pilot the actual height above ground at all times will minimize the danger of flying in fog whilst automatic landing apparatus and air brakes will still further ensure the safety of the airways engines of greater horsepower and different types perhaps developments of the steam turbine or possibly electric motors to which power is transmitted by wireless from ground stations will come into use silent air screws noiseless engines and reduction of vibration will add to the comfort of passengers self-starters will minimize the work of starting up speed will develop enormously until the ordinary passenger going machines will fly at hundreds of miles an hour landing lights will be so perfected and machines will be so reliable that night flying will be as simple as aviation by day parachute or other safety devices will ensure the safety of passengers at all times all these will come in course of time at the present we must go forward steadily with the work of discovery realizing that the science of flying is still in its infancy and knowing without a shadow of doubt that future developments will make our present achievements seem small to the coming generation end of section twenty one recording by john thomas coos john thomas coos kuzmarski www dot validate your life dot com end of the outline of science volume three by j arthur thompson